Welcome to a new breed of golf live. I'm Michael Breed. Excited to be with you on a Thursday afternoon. Got a lot of things to get to. Not a lot of time. I've got a hard stop at three o'clock. The first thing I want to tell you about the poker cheap. We had breast blessed poker cheaps that we did the ball markers excited to be able to bring these to you. There they are right there. You got six different options. If you're interested in getting any, just Email me at a new breed of golf at michaelbreed.com. And by the way, when you email us, you will be reaching one Greg Ducharme. So, Gibbsy, if we could introduce Greg Ducharme and yourself, maybe we could have a there's a there's Greg Ducharme. Yep. Gibbsy, slide in there, duck down. There you are. Steve Gibbs, good job getting in there. So, we've got everybody's here. We're ready to help you on a Thursday. What we're finding is a lot of you are slipping away on a Friday afternoon to go play some golf and not able to join us. So we're going to try Thursday here for a little bit, see how Thursday works. And by the way, speaking of slipping away on a Friday, I know a couple of people that are trying to slip away on a Friday, which is another reason why we're doing this on a Thursday. So don't forget the poker chips. If you're interested in them, just send that email to us at a new breed of golf at michaelbreed.com. Greg Ducharme, please catch the poker cheat. Nice catch. Nice toss. Okay. So let me tell you what we've got coming up. This is a very, very informal uh, get together. We, we, are going to go wherever you want to go. You have any questions, you send those questions to me at a new breed of golf at michaelbreed.com. One of the things I want to talk to you about today is getting you to understand numbers, how numbers work, how they're affected. Some of you have these numbers, some of you don't have numbers. The other thing is when you play the golf course, how do you look at numbers on the course? So we're going to talk to you about that. Also too, this little device that I have, have built. There are many of you that have reached out to me and said, Michael, that thing looks really cool. How do you make it? So I thought, well, you know what? We'll just do a quick thing on how to do this. And I'm also going to show you some of the other instructional devices that I have that I use that can help you tremendously. And those questions that you've got, please get them to me at a new breed of golf at michaelbreed.com or just jump into the chat. You can get them right away. The other thing I want to tell you, I know there's a laundry list of stuff that I want to talk to you about. The other thing I want to tell you is I want to see your golf swings. You all are getting out on the golf course. You've had some time now to get out there. You're working on something. Maybe you've got a question about your golf swing that we don't get to today. Send a video to me. Let me see it. I'm happy to bring that, that golf swing up. Take a look at it either in this platform or in my platform on CBS, my platform on, on uh, Sirius XM. Uh, and for those of you that are unaware of that, well, I'm sorry, then get involved. Sirius XM every morning. Uh, PGA Tour Radio, 8 to 10 in the morning, and then also two on CBS Sports Network. It's called Course Record. Greg and I are doing that. Gibbsy's the one working behind the scenes. And we have an hour-long show that's got some instruction in there. Also has some insights from the tour and things like that. Uh, predictions. Maybe some of you like to bet on stuff. We give you our thoughts on who we like for a certain week or who we don't. Um, so if you're interested in, in being a part of that, maybe having your golf swing be a part of that show, get that uh, golf swing to me when you videotape it make sure that it's in the horizontal don't hold it in the vertical hold it in the in the horizontal there if you send it in the vertical i might help you but i'm not going to put it in any of our shows because it just doesn't work for for uh television get it in the horizontal we can put you in there we'll also put you into the v1 system which we love doing because now i can draw lines and do uh do all the things like that so Gibbsy, maybe you've got a, a, a 10 here and we'll get a little shot of this contraption that we put together so that I can explain to people how this thing is, is um, built. So yeah, let's go down and let's talk about these arms. Okay. So these arms right here, this arm right here that I have in my hand, you can go back to a two if you want, just leave that 10 down there so we can bounce back and forth. This is about three feet long. The pipe itself is three quarters of an inch. And um, I like to put a cap on that because it matches the height of these little adapters that we have in the corners, which I use um, these, these uh, I don't even know what you call them, but it allows me to, to use three of them. Maybe you can get a camera three in here, Gibbsy. Try to drive a three in here low and then just get in there. Zoom right in there so everybody can get a look at this. So this has... Uh, three different ways to, to get the PVC pipe in there. And I like to put it on the corner. That allows me to possibly use a, a piece of PVC pipe coming out of the top. And there's reasons for that as well. But this goes into the end. And then I take, take the arm and I put the arm in here. And now all of a sudden uh, that works. This long, this long part of, of this device is five feet long. So this one right here that goes from this end over to this end 
is five feet long. And then all of these arms are two footers. So uh, again, jump. Yeah, perfect. So from here to here is two feet. And then I cut these, I cut these things to about two feet as well. So I have roughly, roughly a four foot arm here, but this is two feet and this is two feet. Okay. Pretty simple. Um, and it doesn't have to be perfect, but what it does allow you to do is uh, set up all kinds of different obstacles so that you can um, do what you want to do, work on the path of the club head, maybe work on the plane, uh, work on some body motions, work on controlling shin lines. There's all sorts of things that this can do, and it's very easy. The adapters are very easy to use. And so if you're curious about putting it together, and, and here's what I would tell you. Again, this is not a sponsorship, but I go to Lowe's before I go to Home Depot, and not because Home Depot took my trademark, let's do this. That has nothing to do with it, I promise. But what they have at Lowe's that they don't have at Home Depot is this device here, this little contraption here. So Gibbsy, if you could, there you go. So you can see it's not a full uh, piece of pipe. But what it does allow me to do is move these arms into different spots. And so all you do is just step on it and it attaches. And then this thing can fall down like this. It can go like that. I can rotate it like here. So I can do whatever I want. The one little part of this I have that that's a bit of a, of a different one is this little elbow here that's at a 45 degree elbow. And I'll use that for, for pads. So if I take this off and then I might twist this like this. And so what I would do is take this, this is going to be hard to, to do really fast, but take that off, put that one over here, step on this and put this down like that. And now what I'm doing is I'm creating an angle for me to swing over. Now, again, it's extreme. And I do that because I'm trying to learn something. So I'm working on an extreme across, or if I'm working on something that is dramatically from the inside and gives you, you can go to a camera one here or a camera five. So I take this, turn this on an angle like this, Set that like that. And now if I'm working on getting this club to come from the inside, I'm doing this this way. I've got a little block right here. And it helps me take the club and work it from the inside. So there's a couple little different things. This is just something that I've done independently and I'm experimenting with. You don't have to do that. And certainly you don't have to, to build these things the way that I've built them. If you're going to use it, to kind of let's let's go back to that that down the line shot again for me if you would Gibbsy. So this little one right that I have here, I set that up just a single bar that's up into the air, and then go to camera one. Yeah. So if I take the club too much inside, I hit this, I get this to and and this this swim noodle can extend right. So if it's not exactly where I want it, then I can lift it up to get it to to be where I want it to be. But you don't have to have a big, huge contraption like this. You can, you can mess around with this and do little different things. In fact, what you can do is you can build a little device like this, which is what I have as well. And if you're inclined, you can take some, some of this. Now, this is half inch, not three quarter inch. This is half inch. And I use this in a, in a variety of different ways. But also too, with the, with the half inch, what I can do is I can take one of those clips clip it to this spot right here. So I clip it to this spot here and set it down. Or I could take this, turn this up like this. So I twist it like that. It sits right here. Take out the swim noodle, put the swim noodle right there. And now all of a sudden I've created the exact same thing with a lot less expense, not quite the headache, but you know, I, I like to, I like to have a little fun with this stuff. So so this is another device that I built. It's got legs on it. Um, you can see these legs that I have here that come off of this and it can twist, obviously. It's not, it's not um, glued together. It's, it's screwed in there together or, or uh, pushed in there. And I use this for path. So if I'm working on putter path or whatever, I'll, I'll uh, work with this little device. I can twist this if my putter head. So this little space I have in here is about five inches. But if I take this part of the, of the, the device and turn it down like that, like that. Now from here to here, this space is now about four and a quarter 
Yeah, there's a good look. Let me move that over here so you can see that. So if I twist this up in this fashion here, it goes to about five inches. I twist it down, it goes to about four and a quarter. And so if I have a putter head that's a little bit smaller, maybe it's four inches from toe to heel, well, then I'll twist that down. If I've got, it's never greater than, than uh, five inches. I never have to worry about making sure that, that that works that way. And then the other thing I can do it with, and I didn't put this on there, but with the second one of these, I can twist this down and now I can create a little gate for the golf ball to go into. So there's a couple little different things that I do, but this is another one of the devices that I'll, that I'll use. I'm going to get to the numbers here in just a second. I just want to show you a couple other things that I like to, to use. This is a square that I put blue on. And the reason why is that when you go outside, Obviously, the silver of the square can deflect or, or reflect rather the sunlight. So you put blue on it and it doesn't. Um, when I put this down, what this does for me is it allows me to work on uh, a, a position. Of, and I know it's called a square for a reason, right? So when I set up to hit a shot, if I'm practicing, I can put the, the club head right there. It can work in that fashion or... I can twist this this way, put this like this. So now what you see is, is that it's the, the square is sort of in line with the, the golf ball, the back here. So when I put the club in here, I know, oh, you know what? My club face is square. As many of you, when you set up to hit a shot, you don't really understand exactly what a square face looks like. And so what this does is it gives you a real good image of what it looks like. So when you set up to, to hit this ball, and you look down at the leading edge, you go, oh, man, that's square. I, I remember working with a, a guy on, on tour who happened to, to live in a place where they had mats. And he practiced off mats a lot. And what he used to do is he would take the club head and put it up against the mat to make sure what square was. And then he would grab it. And then he would come back like this because he tended to get the club face a little bit closed at a dress. And so he used this to help him get uh, the club face square, get used to what square looked like. It's a, it's a tremendous thing to, to do and something that I know will help you. So that's another thing that I like to have. And then one of the other things that I like to have is a very simple thing. It's just a block of wood. And again, the length of it doesn't matter. This is probably a, a foot and a half. But what I'm doing with this is I, I use this for a variety of different things, including maybe what I used with um, the, the square itself, what I'll do is I'll, I'll set the block of wood like this. The only problem with this is that it's not always true that when the people who cut this, the, the block of wood cut it absolutely perfectly square, it doesn't always happen that way. So I'm pretty cautious with this one. I don't always use this this way. This is a more or less kind of thing. But what I can tell you is, is that if I'm working on paths, so let's go to a down the line and up close down the line. If I'm working on paths, maybe going a little bit into out, I'll put the block of wood down there like that to give myself an image. Or if I'm maybe going, if I want to go across, I'll go this way. And now I'll get an idea of my club as it kind of drags across in this fashion here. I'll use it in a couple of other different ways. One of the things that I'll do is I'll just work on, say, ball position like this. So many of us have an alignment stick. Most of us have at least one, some of us have two, but you might have an alignment stick like this and you put an alignment stick down like that. And then you create this block of wood here and you set it up so that it's perpendicular to the, um, to the alignment stick. And then that's gonna help you with ball positions, right? So I, if, I, if I'm gonna hit a driver, I might be somewhere like that. If I'm hitting a six iron, I might be something like that. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll use this block of wood for, for a ball position thing. Also too, if I'm putting, and again, you can keep it down low on say a seven, perfect. So if I'm putting and I'm, my, my putter path is kind of not where I want it, I'll just do some drills where I, I just put this like this and I let it just glide up and down this uh, block of wood here. And what that does is I, if I put a lot of pressure on that wood, it'll fall over. So I don't want to feel like I'm stuffing the toe into the, into the wood. I just want to feel like it's, it's providing a guide. So, and I'm not making big strokes with that or big swings. I'm just getting used to what that feels like, just gliding that up and down. So a block of wood is a, it's, it's honestly, it's a tremendous um, instructional device. Okay. All right. 
Now I want to talk to you a little bit about the numbers. And by the way, before I get into the numbers, I want to get caught up on, on the action that's taking place uh, on the PGA Tour. So Greg Ducharme, if you could uh, give me a little a little idea with what's going on. At the Charles Schwab Challenge, uh, Thursday opening round, the morning wave is getting underway there. The morning wave is just about done now. We got three tied at the top at four under. Patrick Reed. Webb Simpson and Scotty Scheffler all tied go. at four under. Uh, and then at three under, Dylan Fratelli, who's done. Uh, Harold Varner, the third's three under through 15 holes. Um, and you have actually Where's Colin Morikawa. He had a shot even. He, he shot even par. He had an early tee time. Yeah. I know so that. he played pretty well. And even par, there's a lot, there's a big group at it, one under. It's windy out uh, there, too. Yeah. Tied Where's, 37th is even. Even is 37th. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Justin Thomas shot one over. Okay. He, um, yeah, he's done at one over par. So a lot of, a lot of interesting action out there, yeah. but it's playing tough. Yep. Well, I saw some video from there and the wind was, was blowing like crazy. And a lot of people, um, we had a lot of interaction on, on Twitter, uh, particularly with the decision for Mito prayer to hit driver or three wood off of the tee on the, on the 72nd hole. And there were a lot of people, ah, oh, you got to hit a three wood off the tee there. And, you know, Twitter can be a really good thing. It can sometimes um, not be a, a very good thing. And one of the things that that I'm not necessarily a big fan about Twitter is there's a limitation to what you can do. Also, too, by the way, I'm much better talking than I am typing because if I don't say exactly what I want to say, I can go back and I can I can say it again. And there's also an interpretation. And here's the way here's the way I look at this decision of Mito's. He's got a one shot lead. And when he comes to the 18th hole, I said on Twitter, he needs a par or a birdie. If he makes a birdie, he wins by two. If he makes a par, he wins by one. So it doesn't matter whether he makes par or birdie. If he makes bogey, he goes to a playoff, and he makes double or triple or quad, he misses the playoff. And so players on the PGA Tour are playing to win. And a lot of people go, well, if you hit a three-wood, you're going to get into the fairway. That's not necessarily the case. In fact, some players would rather hit driver than hit three-wood. Many players hit driver on 18. Some hit three-wood, but most hit driver. One of the reasons why is it's a dog leg to the right. And a dog like to the right, it's easier to move the ball to the right. Now, I know you could say, well, but he's got to not hit it in the water. If you hit it in the water, it's a one-stroke penalty. It's not like hitting it out of bounds. If there had been a boundary line down there that close, you could have talked me into, yeah, he, he should have hit a three-wood because you're typically not going to lose a three-wood as far to the right as you would. But at the same time, if you hit a three-wood and it gets into the rough and it doesn't go down the hill, there's a little uh, – ridge that, that runs right through there. If it doesn't go down the hill, now all of a sudden you have an enormous shot into this green. And if you make bogey, you're going to a playoff. And if you make, if you end up in a playoff, you're not guaranteed of winning. The only thing that guarantees you to win is to make a four. And we talk about this all the time. There are players that want the ball. There are players that don't want the ball. Mito Pereira wants the ball. He wants the tee shot. He wants the driver. He didn't execute the shot. End of story. And, and there were some people that compared it to Jean Vandeveld. That is as irrational a comparison as comparing me to, to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, honestly, because a one-shot lead is so different than a three-shot lead. Three-shot lead, you can hit a six-iron off the tee. You can hit an eight-iron. You can hit a nine-iron into the green. You can hit a nine-iron, 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 and two-putt if you want to do that. I don't care because you have a three-shot lead, so all you got to do is make six or better. A one-shot lead, totally different. In fact, the difference between a two-shot lead and a one shot and, and a, a, a three-shot lead is bigger than just one shot. It's a ton. And if Mito had had a two or three-shot lead, you might have seen a different strategy. But with a one-shot lead, you got to pad up and you got to hit a shot, and that's the way it is. So the question is, do you want to pad up and hit a shot with a driver and make the rest of the hole that much easier? Or do you want to pad up and hit a three wood so you can pad up and hit a long iron so you can pad up and hit a long putt so you can, or chip? I mean, all of a sudden by hitting three wood, now you're just kind of kicking the can down the road. But at some point, you got to hit a shot. And so I was, I, I thought Mito's decision to hit driver there was absolutely fine. He just didn't make the swing that he needed to make. So simple as that. All right, Gibbsy, let's bring that four up into the corner. And again, anybody has any questions, get those uh, questions to us in the chat. Now, I want to explain to you about these numbers and how these numbers work. Because there are many of you that, that are curious when you see something, you go, well, what does this all mean? Don't make the mistake of thinking that a horizontal launch 
is where the path of the club is going. That's not what it is. The horizontal launch is where the ball started. And all the information, absent of this club head speed, which I'm going to get to in a second, all the information on here is ball information. That's all it is. This club speed thing is a guess when I don't have a marker on the on this club. And I typically don't put a marker on the club for a variety of reasons because one being, I don't really care about club head speed. And club head speed is important, but I don't really care about it. It's you can measure it, but what it really is, is the game is ball speed. Ball speed to me is what the whole thing is all about. You create higher ball speeds, you're going to hit the ball farther. You create uh, lower ball speeds, you're not going to hit the ball as far. You can create high club head speeds and still miss hit the strike and have a lower ball speed, right? So when I'm when I'm doing what I'm doing up here and when I'm working with my players, I am focusing on what the ball is doing. The ball to me is it's the whole game. That's the whole game. Does it start left? Does it start right? What's the apex? What's the descent angle, spin rates, speeds, all that stuff. That to me is what's important. So horizontal launch simply says, like that last shot that I hit when I had the block of wood there, that the ball started about four degrees to the left. Now, that does not mean that the path of the club was four degrees to the left. This shot that I hit had 981 RPMs to the right. Now, what that means is, is that the club face was to the right of the path of the club. That's how it starts. Uh, I'm sorry. That's how it curves to the right. The ball starts to the left because the path is left. And my face is affecting the start line. But it doesn't necessarily mean that my club face is open to the target. And I, I want to I do a little drawing here so you understand this. So let's come over here. I'm going to do a little drawing here so that you understand. So here's my here's my flag. Okay? Here is my golf ball. Okay? Now, there are many of you that believe that the path of the golf club is where this ball will start. That's not true. There are many of you also that think that if you hit a fade, that the face of the golf club is going to be open or closed to the target. That may or may not be true. Okay. And I'll show you what I mean. So if I have, let's say this is the flag right here. And let's say this spot right here is four degrees to the left. And I hit a ball that starts four degrees to the left and then spins back to the target like that. So my, my path, let's use a red line. So my path going like this is not going four degrees. What actually it's going is greater than four degrees because it curved to the right. And so the face at that point has to be open to that path in order for it to, to curve to the right. And that face could be right here. So let's say that face is two degrees. So half the distance between the four degrees left and dead zero, which is the ultimate end of, of where the ball is, is supposed to go. What many people call the target. I try not to get to, to targets. And the reason why I try not to, I don't know what your target is. Are you trying to get your ball to get to the flag? Are you trying to get it so it comes down but doesn't get to the, to the flag? Maybe you want it to end up 10 feet uh, left of the flag. I don't know. So I, I don't pay attention to that. What I pay attention to is where are you starting it and what did you do with the, with the curve? But this is what you need to appreciate. If my ball starts four degrees to the left of this target and curves to the right, this is where this gets confusing. And this is why it's important to understand. My club face is two degrees open to the path. 
and two degrees closed to the target, provided that the target is the flag. That's why it gets confusing. Because people will tell you, well, you can hit a shut-faced fade. When they say that, what they're doing is they're referring to the target. I don't do that because I don't know what your target is. I don't know what the target is. I never hit a shot. Like if I hit a shot in here, um, let's say I'm hitting a tee shot and I'm trying to get it to curve. I'm just trying to get it to curve to the right. So all I want is I want the face to be open to the path. That's it. That's all I want. I want it to be open to the path. So if I swing this thing at four degrees, uh, if I start this thing four degrees to the to the left and I have an open path, my path could have been six degrees, could have been seven, it could have been eight, because a lot of it also too has to do with the contact point on the club face, okay? High and low, toe to heel, that stuff. So, but again, to just make things a little bit easier, my path could have been six degrees left. My face could have been two degrees to the right of that, which deflects the ball to start four degrees to the left of the target and then curve to the target. That's it. So when you start looking at numbers, you got to understand, and particularly when you're trying to understand what people are talking about, you always got to find out. You always got to ask this question. Are you talking about relative to the path or relative to the target? That's essential for this entire thing. So please understand, when you see this number up here, and it says 3.9 degrees in the horizontal launch, that does not mean that the path was 3.9 degrees to the left. It means that the path was more than that. If this curves to the right, if the ball starts to the left and curves to the right, or if it starts to the left and curves to the right, the face would be to the left or to the right of the path, depending on where I'm swinging. So if I'm going out to the right, it starts to the left, it curves to the left. My face is going to be closed to the path for a right-hander. I would say it will be left of the path. And in this situation, my club face is to the right of the path. I hope you all understand that. And then what starts to happen is, is as I start to get more cut spin or more draw spin, now all of a sudden I get varying things that are going to occur. And um, I can get more spin or less spin. I can get higher apexes, lower apexes. I can get higher launch angles, lower launch angles. So I have this horizontal launch, and then I have a vertical launch. And the vertical launch is what the golf ball does when it leaves. Now, this is another thing that's important to understand. When I launch the ball at 17 degrees, and I'm making up a number for simple math, okay? So I have a 17-degree launch. I have 37 degrees um, that, that's on my club face. So when I take 17, to get it to go to 17 from 37 would be 20. So my shaft would have had 20 degrees of shaft lean. That's not the way this works. It's not the way it works. Because also, too, when you have this thing going the way you have it, the strike point has a lot to do with the launch. Has a lot to do with the launch. And um, the impact point on the face has a lot to do with the launch. So all I'm telling you is when you look at this, don't just think, well, you know what? At 17 degrees, he must have leaned that shaft 20 degrees. That's not true. Now, what I can tell you is, is that in order for me to, to have that leave at 17 degrees, I do have to have some... Uh, lean forward, but it's not as dramatic. With a six iron, um, it's typically right around, depending upon the player, uh, it can be anywhere from, say, seven to, to 12 degrees of shaft lean you'll get in that. And players with 12 degrees of shaft lean, they're going to flight this ball out a little bit lower, and they probably have a lot more club head speed. They're probably a little bit stronger, um, and they're probably apexing the ball a little bit higher. Okay? So that's some of the stuff that we talk about. Now, one of the things that, that I've been asked about is this thing, spin ratio. And people say, well, what is spin ratio? This is a number that I just put up there for me. But it, it's, this is simply this. It's the relationship of the side spin to the back spin. So the spin ratio, the ratio of nine, 
181 over 2,810 is about 35%. It's about 35%. So what I can tell you is, is that when I'm working with uh, elite players, the spin ratios will typically be under 5%. Okay? Um, and that that is true with all clubs. The difference is, is that when you have a spin ratio of 5% with a driver, that can curve a lot. And a spin ratio of 5% with a, a pitching wedge isn't going to curve a lot. So that's that's a big thing to understand. The other thing that's a big thing to understand is, is that if I have 981 um, RPMs of right spin on a, a wedge, that might be a 10% spin ratio because I have 10,000 RPMs of, of spin rate with a, a pitching wedge. I know this stuff is, is pretty elaborate. If I have 981 RPMs of right spin with a driver and the driver has 2,810 2, um, RPMs of backspin, this ball is going to curve a lot. So the higher the spin ratio, the more curve I'm going to get. It's a, a pretty easy way of saying that. If I have a, a big spin ratio, I'm going to have a big turn. If I have small spin ratio, I'm going to have a little bit of turn. So under 5%. Not going to curve a whole lot. Uh, a thirty-five percent. I'm going to get a, a a tremendous amount of curve. And if you have thirty-five percent spin ratio with a pitching wedge, you have done some dramatically, dramatically wrong things, including probably uh, miss miss hit it. And the other thing is, you can sometimes get a misread. That happens on some of this stuff. So that that's that's sort of some inside the numbers stuff. And and I thought that 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 would be a nice jumping off point. Um, so I'm sure we've got some questions that we do now. Let's jump right into the questions. This first one from Presley. Could you explain some of the common factors causing a steep angle of attack? Okay. So there's a couple of things that that'll create a steep angle of attack. Let me go back over here to my, my drawing board and let me do some erasing here. So steep angles of attack can be created in a number of different ways. One way is, and I want you to imagine now that when I do this drawing, that the golf ball is going away from what we call camera four. It's going away from us going through into this screen, okay? So here's the golf ball right here. A steep angle of attack is basically going to have the head of the golf club in this down the line view pretty close to this strike line. It's pretty close to the strike line the whole way. So the, a steep angle of attack might have the club coming like this, as opposed to having the club coming like that. Okay. So if we go, um, Gibbsy, let's go down this way. So a steep angle of attack here is going to be this. That's steep. And what you can see, and I don't know if you can get even a, a, a little close-up shot. Yeah. So if I have this club coming down like this, that's steep. And it's steep because there's a ton of space between the ground and the, and the golf club, the head of the club. And it's coming down almost like a, a Ferris wheel here. It's coming down like this. Shallow angle of attack, it's coming in like this. Typically, shallow angles of attack are going to have the club coming more from the inside. That would create a shallow angle of attack. Steep angle of attack, the club is coming more typically from the outside or from closer to the strike line. Also, too, what will create um, steep angles of attack and shallow angles of attack will be the length of the shaft of the golf club. So I will typically have, even though I might make the exact same golf swing, I'm going to have a steeper shall, a, a steeper angle of attack with a six iron than I will with a driver. But I'm also going to have a steeper angle of attack with a pitching wedge than I will with a six iron because the pitching wedge
is a couple of inches shorter here, maybe three inches shorter um, right there, which you might be able to, to see that difference. So what you're, what you're getting when you get a, a shorter, a shorter, uh, yeah, there you go. Good luck. So if I have a shorter club, now I'm standing closer to the ball. And when I stand closer to the ball, the club's going to now come down this way. That's why I say to you, when you're trying to hit low shots, moving the ball back can work, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to steepen your angle of attack. Steepening your angle of attack is achieved without question by standing closer to the golf ball. When I stand closer to the ball, I don't have any room to get the club to come from in here. So it's going to be coming like this. And then I'm going to be able to drop the club down on the ball. And that's going to create a steeper angle of attack. Now, there's other things that cr can create steeper angles of attack. One of them is the level of your shoulders. If I have my shoulders set up so that they're parallel to the ground, that's going to create a steep angle of attack. If I have my shoulders where they're sort of pointing up into the air, that's going to create a shallower angle of attack. There's all kinds of different things that can create steeps and shallows. And, and uh, my friend Chuck Cook has, has done a lot of really uh, keen insight with it. Also, too, one of your favorite coaches, Jim Hardy, has yep. talked a lot about this stuff. Um, steep angles of attack can, can be achieved with a lot of wrist set. If I take the club back and I hinge my wrists, now I can create a steep angle of attack as opposed to um, uh, a, a wrist hinge that doesn't have a lot of, of angle to it because that has to do with the width of the swing. So how far this club head is away from the golf ball versus how narrow it is, there's a steep, like back swings tend to be shallower than down swings because the width of the, the swing in the back swing is for good players particularly is wider in the backswing and shallower, I mean, steeper in the downswing, narrower in the downswing. So we get wide and narrow, which creates sort of shallower and steeper. The easier way, it's the, it's the easiest way to say it for you to be able to understand it. So there's a number of little different things that, that can create it. Weight distribution can, can make a, a swing steep or shallow. Ball position can make a a swing steep or shallow and not just, you know, near and close, but left and right. So if I move the ball back in my stance, that tends to shallow. If I move it forward in my stance, it tends to, to steepen and it has to do with how your shoulders are. So closed shoulders tend to create a shallower path. Open shoulders tend to create a steeper path. So there's a number of things that, that, um, affect steep and shallow in a golf swing. Go ahead. This may be along similar lines. It's from David. How can I lower my ball flight? I hit my irons incredibly high. Now, uh, Dean offered to trade some of his low ball flight for some of David's high ball <laughs> flight, but I don't think that's going to work too well. No, I don't think that's going to work too well either. So um, here's the easiest way to, to bring down trajectory. Pre-swing, alter your ball position and stand closer to the ball. If I stand closer to the ball, I'm going to I'm going to steepen that angle of attack and I'm going to drive that ball down a little bit lower. That that happens that way. Also too, I can take my shoulders and I can I can change those a little bit. So if I if I get set up and you might be setting up something like this, if you just do this, you're going to hit a ball um lower, certainly lower in the in the launch of it. You'll you'll hit it lower. So uh putting a little change into what you're doing with your shoulder line um, we'll certainly get that done. But here's what I would say to you. One of the easiest things for you to do is just change your grip. You strengthen your grip. The club will not have as much loft on it when it gets to the ball because it'll be more closed. Second thing is, is that when you get into the strike, when you have a, a stronger grip, you tend to get a little bit more shaft lean. And shaft lean is going to drive that ball down. If I have the shaft of the golf club leaning backwards when I come in here like this, this is going to throw that ball up into the air. So I launched that one at 26.6 degrees, just flicking it. The shaft at impact was leaning back like that. If I do the exact same thing, and this time I'm going to exaggerate because I strengthened my grip this way, and now I come in there and hit that shot there which is probably going to go about the same distance. 
And that golf ball left at an eight degree launch angle. So I took one that was at 26.6. And by just changing my grip, making it a little bit stronger, and I come into that, now all of a sudden when I get to the strike, I've got a little bit of shaft lean, which is going to take some loft off the face, which is going to start the ball a little bit lower and give you a launch angle of about eight. Okay? All right. Uh, from Travis. Thanks, Michael. Trying to master the 30 to 50 yard pitch. What's the number to look for in backspin? Uh, and is it just a function of backswing, length of speed of the uh, uh, length and speed of the swing? No, it's not a function of just that. It's also a function of the club that you use, right? And what I would say is Travis. Do you say Travis? Travis. Yeah. yeah. So Travis, here's what I would say to you. And I, I these are the, I hate these answers because you almost feel like you're empty with the answer, but um, I promise you this is truth. Okay. So, and it might sit in, set in after uh, you've messed with this a little bit, but the first thing is you've got to make sure that you use the same golf ball. And I tell you this all the time, and it sounds like it's a sell job. And I know that you guys go, well, Breed's a Titleist guy. And yeah, and I appreciate you knowing that I'm a Titleist guy. And I think Titleist is the best and, you know, on and on and on. But it still doesn't remove the point that, you have to use the same golf ball because whether I use a Pro V1X or an AVX that have different spin rates, they have the same spin rate from AVX to AVX to AVX. And at that point, what I can do is I can predict spin rate. And so what's important on a 30 to 50 yard shot is not that you have more or less spin, it's that you have predictable spin. So that if I'm hitting a, say, a 50-yard shot to a back hole location, I can take my pitching wedge with my Pro V1X and I can hit it. And I can, by using a pitching wedge versus using a 60, I have taken spin off of the shot, right? So let me, um, let me do this. I'm going to hit a 50-yard shot with a pitching wedge or try to hit a 50-yard shot with a pitching wedge in my little jungle gym. So 50 yards. Okay. That's pretty good. So here you go. So this is my 50 yard shot with a pitching wedge. I hit this shot. It flew 51 yards. It had 6,000 RPMs of spin and it rolled out an additional nine or 10 feet, something like that. Now I'm going to switch and I'm going to go to a 60 degree wedge which is for me 58. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to hit this 50 yards. Okay. So now, boy, I got lucky on this one. This is great. So that one flew 50.6. So pretty similar. I mean, nearly identical. But this one had 9,131 RPMs of spin. So the shot that I hit with my pitching wedge that landed at 50, rolled out to 53, okay? This one landed at 50.6 and rolled back to 49.4. So I had 3,000 more RPMs of backspin, and as a result, I had a completely different reaction when the ball got onto the green. And so what I can say to you is, and this is, you, you got to understand this, it's the consistency of the, of the amount of spin that you get that gives you the predictability of the rollout. Because when you're hitting these shots, what you have to be able to do is control the distance that the ball is in the air and the distance that it's on the ground. And what controls the distance that it's on the ground? Well, the spin rate has a lot to do with it. Also, to the descent angle. So the descent angle of my 58-degree wedge is 42.3 degrees on that particular shot. Now, I didn't see what my descent angle was with my pitching wedge, but I would imagine that it was less than that because it's flatter. And when it's coming in flatter, it's going to help roll out a little bit. So you're changing not just the spin, but also the descent angle. And that happens with the golf club. So simply put, know how to hit 50-yard shots with all these different clubs and know what your spin rates are, not um, not how much, but how consistent they are. I'm, I'm fortunate because I'm in here and I have all this stuff that's available for me. That's what these numbers allow me to, to do. So I go, and, and again, 
the weird part is, is that I can just grab a club and make a 50 yard swing. I happen to be hitting some 50 yard shots over the last week. And I've done a couple of these. So I just go 50. My brain produces it. And I trust it. To, I don't, I don't doubt it. I just hit it. And it comes out. As, I mean, that stuff is freaky to me. But what's also amazing is, is that that golf ball spins a whole lot more because I'm hitting a golf club that has more loft. So I have to hit it a little bit harder. This one's almost 10 degrees. Uh, maybe a little bit more. That pitching wedge is 46. This is 40, 58. So 12 degrees more. And yet I got a different reaction, but I got predictability. I know the pitching wedge is going to roll forward. I know my, my 58 is going to roll backward. Okay. So know what, know what the spins are and play the same golf ball. Okay. I hope that it's a Pro V1 or Pro V1X or some Titleist product, but just make it the same ball. I promise you, make it the same ball. Okay, go ahead, Greg. This is from Sarge. If you don't have a way to get on a TrackMan to GC Quad, is there a way to get a solid estimate of your numbers to optimize your ball flight, club path, etc.? Um. So, Sarge, uh, here's here's what I would tell you. Um, there are some things that you can do that uh require a little bit of work you can do it um but it takes a little bit of it it takes a little bit of um of work to get it done but simply put here's what i would tell you what i would tell you is to say that we don't have a chance to get on on some sort of a launch monitor to me is is just saying that you're not willing to work that hard to go and do it and what i would tell you is is that i would imagine that within an hour of where you are, there's somebody that has a launch monitor. And what you need to do is you need to just pick up a phone and call all these different people. And eventually you just go, hey, do you have a launch monitor? Yes. Okay, what kind of launch monitor do you use? Well, I have a TrackMan or I have a Foresight or whatever it is. But as if they say yes, then you go, okay, um, can I come out there and borrow it? You might not even be a member. Do you, can I come out? Can I take a lesson? Do you allow people to come out and take a lesson? And they're going to say, yeah, they do. How much is it? It's 80 bucks. Okay. So take 80 of your dollars for an hour, go out there with the guy and just say, look, here's what I want to do. I don't necessarily need you to give me any swing advice. I want to try to see if any of my numbers are consistent and then just hit with somebody. Maybe there's a club champion nearby you. They've got all that information. Go in there and see if you can rent out the individual or rent out the space and invest some money in yourself so that you know this stuff and you can have some predictability in it. To say that, to say that you, you can't get to somebody with a launch monitor to me just implies that you haven't thought of maybe picking a phone up and making some phone calls. And I think if you think of picking a phone up and calling some people, I think you would find that you're probably going to have six or eight or 10 people that are near you that have this. And then just ask them what they, what they, what they would charge for you to come out and get that information. And you might even be able to, to maybe there's an assistant pro that doesn't charge as much. Maybe they charge 50 bucks and you go, Hey, here's the deal. I just want you to just write down my numbers that I have for me. I don't need any insight. Just write down the numbers so that I have an idea of what's going on. That would be the way I would I would go about doing that. Okay, okay. Uh, this is from Matt. Uh, loving the info so far. Is, Thank you, Matt. Is a forward shaft lane at a dress with irons a beneficial way to best use the club's loft, or does having it fairly straight does having a fairly straight up and down shaft work? Yeah. It, look, everybody's different. So if you decide that that let me get a different club here. If you decide that what you're going to do is set up to the ball and create a little bit of, of shaft lean at a dress. So you're going to go like this. The one thing that I would then ask you to do is make sure that your grip is stronger because if you do, if you have a weak grip, go to a full shot there, Gibbsy, if you would, if you have a weak grip and you let your hands get forward, it's going to really affect your shoulder line. Your shoulder line will get way open. And so what I would tell you is, is that if you're going to have forward shaft lean at a dress, what I would argue or, and what I would urge you to do is try to feel like you've got a stronger grip and that, that will help you. Okay. You don't have to do that, but, but what I would, what I would say is, is that in your pre-swing, don't think that pre-swing looks like in swing, in swing. I want shaft lean. F stronger grips will help you with that. 
Um, but if you decide to start like this, or you just start decide to start with a strong grip and get like, I don't care. I just want what the ball knows. And here's the easiest thing for you to understand. The ball doesn't know anything until it's put into motion. Once it's put into motion, it knows how fast this club is traveling, what the loft is on it, where the strike point is. It knows that. At address, it knows nothing. So you just have to make sure that if you're going to lean that shaft forward at address, strengthen up that grip and then make sure that you return to that. Okay? Okay. David, uh, who was hitting the ball really high before. Yeah. He says, I have a strong grip already. You have a strong grip and you're still hitting it high. Yes, with irons. Okay. Then at that point, what I would say is, David, then you're just, you're tossing the club. So here's what I would tell you to, to in fact, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to show you something else here. I had a lesson today with my friend, Eddie, who's a tremendous guy. He's a very good player. In fact, Eddie, believe it or not, at his club, won the senior club championship and the club championship in the same year. Now he's a little bit older now, and he hasn't really been hitting a lot of balls for a lot of different reasons. And he's coming back in and he said, Michael, how can I get this ball to start a little bit lower? How can I get this golf ball to pierce out a bit more? And I said, well, Eddie, we got to focus on the angle that that right forearm is at right there. So that right forearm is at about 56 degrees. Now, if I go over to Sam Burns, and I know these guys, I understand these guys are hitting a drive. One guy's hitting a driver, one guy's hitting an iron. I get it, okay? I get it. But Sam Burns, when he gets to this impact position, his forearm is at a 34-degree angle. And what you can see when you look at these two positions of the forearms is they're in very, very different positions. And so this is a, a very easy thing to understand. If I impact the ball and the shaft of the golf club is pointing to my trail shoulder, I will have a forearm that is in effect, perpendicular to the ground. It's not, but it, for all intents and purposes, it is. But if I take the shaft of the golf club and I point it outside of my lead shoulder, now look at what happens to my forearm. So when I go like this, my body is relatively square. It gives you, give me a, a split here with a, a one and a two, if you would. So what you're going to see is, yeah, there you go. So right there, pretty square with my shoulders, my knees, and my hips. And then in the face on, my, my forearm is pretty much perpendicular to the ground. Now I take it, I put my forearm in this position here. Look at how much different my body on the left looks now. My body is rotated out of the way. You can actually see this shoulder and the back of it. You can see the foot joy right there on, the, on my back, where here, when I set up, you can't. You can only see the Titleist. And when I go here, the Titleist disappears. Now look at the angle that my forearm is at here versus here. So if you want to hit the ball lower, one of the things that you have to do is get that forearm so that it is sort of pointing out that way. And when you do that, you're going to now flight the ball out quite a bit lower. It'll come out quite a bit lower. So if your grip is already strong and you're hitting it high, then pay attention to what's going on with your forearm because your forearm is not in the right spot. Okay. Pretty simple. Can me, can you give me an update? Of course. So same leaders. Um, we, the only addition to the leaders is Harold Varner, the third, he got in there at four under along with Reed Simpson and Scheffler. All those guys are done. Kevin Na got done at three under par along with uh, Dylan Fratelli. Uh, and there's a group of players at two under par. Some of them, including Stuart Sink, are just getting out there. Um, Sink is two under through five. Nick Taylor's two under through five. Daniel Berger is two under through three. So there's some there's some good rounds out there early. Yep. Um, with that opening, the opening par five there, number one, there's definitely some birdies on that hole. Terrific. So, yeah. Okay. All right. What do we got? All right. We've got um, about five more minutes left. Okay. From This one from David. I struggle a lot with three wood off the grass. I'm not convinced I can get the ball off the ground. What can I do to improve my contact and confidence? Okay. So, um, again, a couple different things. 
If you have a if you have a three wood right now that has an adjustable head, you can add loft into that. Just adjust it so you add some loft in that. Okay, it's a it's a simple thing to do. The TSIs you can you can add loft in. I think you can add up to a degree and a half of of loft, and that that'll kind of help you. But I think primarily the the thing that you said that to me was the most valuable is you're having a difficult time getting the thing into the air. And you have a difficult time getting in the air because you look down, this, this club here has the least amount of loft for a shot that you hit where the ball's on the ground, other than a putter. So you're making a full swing with a three wood and you think in your mind, I gotta be superhuman to get this up into the air. Here's what I would tell you, take a divot. Make a divot with a, a three wood. Take a practice swing and swing down and make a divot. And when you make that divot, what you're doing is you're driving that club into the ground and what you're going to do is you're going to get a lot of the um, a lot of the loft of the club will will help you create spin. Not all the loft, but a lot. I, I've said this so badly. Let me try that again. When you hit down on the ball, what you're going to do is you're going to create a a brushing across the golf ball, which will create some spin, and then the loft itself is going to help you. So you're going to strike the ball in the face somewhere, lower or middle of the face, but it'll also have a little bit of roll up the face because of the glancing blow cutting across by taking a divot. And what that what that does is, is that the ball doesn't roll up the face, but it'll, it'll roll up a little bit as it's going. So it'll kind of leave and twist back and that spin rate will help get the ball up in the air as well. So you might be able to launch it at a similar launch, but because the spins on it, you put more spin on it. Say you get 4,000 RPMs of spin on it. Now all of a sudden that ball will lift up into the air. That's one of the things that I would tell you to do. The other thing I would tell you to do is grip down on this club, which you then can nudge a little closer to the ball, which then will allow you to have a steeper three wood, which will then allow you to take a divot. Simple as that. Okay. Enjoy the ride. Yep. All right. Go ahead. From Cody. I have a negative upper body bend at the top of my backswing. Any recommendations how to get a better position at the top? I, Cody, am not quite sure what a negative upper body bend is. So my guess think, would be maybe a reverse. So pivot. you think you, so what you're saying is when, when Cody takes the club back that he's tilting this way. That's my, that's my guess. Okay. All right. So, if that's Cody, if you're nodding now, here's what I would tell you to do for me. If you would take a video and send it to me. So I know what, what I'm dealing with and I can come back to that. Maybe even, uh, help you, um, in, in one of our shows, make sure you hold that camera horizontally, but here's what I would tell you. This is a simple thing to do. If that's what you're doing, when you get it address, I want you to feel like you're going to tilt your shoulders when you make practice swings. I want you to imagine you got a hockey stick. You're going to let this hand get down like this and keep that trail hand here and then teach yourself to do this. And what you're going to do when you do that is that you, you aren't going to tilt this way. You'll stay in here like this. You'll stay in here like this and you'll end up getting used to this, this position, lead shoulder high, uh, trail shoulder low, and you'll be under that way. That would be one of the things that I would tell you to do. Now, another thing that you can do is, and these are always challenging things to do. Some people say, well, stand on a bucket or stand on some something. Here's what I like to do. I like to just set up, lift. You're going to go down the line here, Gibbsy. So lift your, your lead foot in the air. You can see how I'm just on my toe here. So you're going to lift that in the air like this and then just swing and don't let that heel drop down. Go to a, a camera three here for, give, for me, Gibbsy, and don't, don't chase the ball on this one. So here, you can see the heel is, is up in the air. You can see how dramatic that knee flex is right there. And now all you're going to do is just hit there. And what you're going to see when you, when you do this, I'm not tilting. I'm not going to tilt forward because if I tilt forward, now that heel goes down and now I lean in there. So I want you to keep that heel in the air. You're going to still get plenty of hip turn. Keep that heel in the air and then go that way. That's, that's, that's how I would do it. Um, all right, listen, uh, we unfortunately have to go. Um, I've got some knee issues that I got to deal with, so I'm off to, to PT. I hope everybody has a great weekend, and I hope you enjoyed uh, what we did today here on A New Breed of Golf. Remember, if you guys want those poker chips, 
Send those emails to me at a new breed of golf at michaelbreed.com. Really appreciate Gibbsy. Take a peek in here again. Really appreciate the hard work um, from Greg Ducharme and from Steve Gibbs. They're the guys that are that are working uh, hard all the time and helping us to to get this information to you. And hopefully, as we go through the the time together, you get a better understanding of how to move the golf club, not just for you but for everybody, and then start to understand how you can make changes to your golf swing. We love doing these things. It's a, it's a big deal for us. So um, I, I want to make sure that, that you know how much uh, we appreciate this. The other thing is this. No political statement here, but this is this. There are a lot of people that whose lives altered irreparably uh, a couple of days ago down in, down in Texas. And I know I speak for all of us when, when I say we're all thinking about those individuals, those families that that have been affected um, by all this, I will tell you, I hardly know anybody um, who's down there, but I know that my my soul and my family's soul has been altered as a result of, of what's taken place. There's not an individual around that I've talked to that hasn't been thinking about this and had this on their mind. And if you're so inclined to, to help these individuals out, please do what you can do. Maybe it's giving of time. Maybe it's um, giving some whatever dollars, I don't know. Um, but just try to see what you can do to try to, to make things better for those people in those communities. And also well, as well, maybe in your community, maybe there are some people that are hurting. Maybe there are some people that are not really sure about, um, you know, next steps of how they're going to do it. Maybe there's somebody that, you know, who's got a child who's, who's going through some really difficult stuff. Get involved. Don't sit back and watch. Take responsibility for, for this. We got to figure out a, a way how to, how to solve this. But what I really want you to do is just keep those, those families, that community in your thoughts and in your prayers as, as um, this time goes on. It's a very difficult time for all of us as we try to make sense of something you can't make sense of. So make sure you keep those individuals in your thoughts and your prayers. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Play some great golf. And we look forward to uh, to talking with you again tomorrow morning on A New Breed of Golf on Sirius XM. Thanks so much for joining.